God, we welcome you this morning. Thank God for you. I uh, trust the Lord will minister to you. I've enjoyed doing this series. This is part seven. Uh, Jesus gave us the gospel. Pentecost gave us the power. Jesus came and declared and demonstrated the gospel, the good news. These are a series of messages I've preached. Many of you have heard all of them. The gospel is a language. I mentioned that when I was a sinner, I never remember saying hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Honey, let's get our offering. Have you written our check for our offering? I remember saying, let's go to prayer. I never remember saying any of that. That's gospel language. Has a language, and, and there's many aspects of that language. Yeah. But if we're not careful, we have a tendency to be bilingual. We speak the gospel language at church and with God's people. And then we go home and speak the world's language. Or we go to work and speak the world's language. The world's language is filled with unbelief and doubt. It's filled with anger. It's filled with bitterness and jealousy and division and envy. God's language is filled with love and grace and compassion and vision and destiny and purpose and heaven. I preached on that and then I did a number of sermons and, and it's Pentecost promised the power, gave us the power. The Apostle Paul has this incredible experience with Jesus, not from his animal, blinded voices, and yet God still said, I want you to go to church to get direction. He said, Lord, what would you have me do? He said, it's what I want you to do. There's a disciple waiting for you, Ananias. I want you to go. He's going to tell you what to do. And I preach to that. Can anybody tell you what to do? Ananias, he went to Ananias. Uh, he went to Paul, uh, prayed for him, gave him direction, and his eyes were opened, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. In the, here's this incredible supernatural experience, and yet God still said, this man needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, I thank with God. I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. Uh, these men that he ran into, disciples of John, and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we've not even heard about it. And he prayed for them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Then I mentioned about power. Power always has a source. And I talked about these lights. These lights here, uh, uh, you know, the microphone, the illumination, the air conditioning goes on and on. But the source is probably either uh, the uh, Hoover Dam, the Salt River, uh, or Palo Verde Power Plant, etc. And you have to be connected to the source to have power. Are you connected to the source? You have to be connected. It's one thing to have power. It's another thing. And Power always has a purpose. Listen to what I'm saying. Power always, God saved you for purpose. The, in other words, that power, if it didn't have a purpose, if it was just flashing all over this building, then we would be in trouble. That'd be chaos. It has a purpose. It's harnessed. There's electric wires. There's insulation. I talked about a tornado years ago in Marion, Illinois. And hell will create power outages. Hell will bring storms into your life to have a power shortage or outage. That's why many times you have to be reconnected or recharged. I had a couple of, of guns up here, uh, 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 not, not weapons, but uh, Bobby's tools up. Uh, power drills, and I had one had a full battery, the other one the battery, I held the trigger, uh, and that's kind of like we are, and we had to be recharged. I had a charger, it had to be recharged. We have to be recharged. Yeah. This morning, I want to move on to sometimes we miss the factor. 
when it comes to being connected to the power or the authority. I mentioned there's two Greek words for power. Uh, one of these is the ability and the other is the right or the legislation. Jesus said, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. That's the, the right to do it. The other is, the word, you get the word dynamite, uh, it's with the ability to do it. I use an illustration. You can have a license to drive an automobile. That means Arizona has given you the right to drive an automobile in the United States of America. It's another thing to have the ability to do it. And so I want to look at an issue that's easily overlooked. And many times we think it's not critical. We wonder why we're powerless or limited in power. Uh, we're saying the right things, uh, but it's not happening. I want to make a statement to you. I'll make it several times. Submission positions you for power. Submission positions you for kingdom power. James 4, 7. Uh, Therefore, submit to God. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Father, we come by the blood this morning, by the power of the Holy Ghost. God, anoint us. Give us revelation to feed your people. God, give them ears, God, to hear, God. Change us from glory to glory in the name of Jesus. So what does it mean this morning to submit or to be in submission? Uh, this word in the Bible means to place oneself under the authority of another. It means to surrender your will to another. When it's not your preference. It's not what you would choose. It's not what you want to do. Submission is not doing something that you already want to do. Submission has to do when you place your will under the authority of another. It's when you're told to do it. Or you know what you need to do. You know that it's right to do, and you submit to that. Paul, I mentioned, when he said, Lord, what would you have me do? That was submission that set his life in motion for God's ability to work incredible things. A not a likely candidate. He had killed Christians. Holding the garments of those who stoned Stephen. And yet, that simple statement of submission. Have you made that statement? Lord, what would you have me do? Not what I want to do. Not what I plan to do. But Lord, what would you? Jesus in the garden. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That positioned him for his purpose and the power to bring salvation to all who would believe. Remember what I said. Submission positions you for power. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is a wedding. This is Jesus' first miracle. They're there and wine, it was, a, it was a form of grape juice. They, they run out of wine. And in John 2, 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. He told them to fill six water pots with water. And he said, now draw some out and take it to the master. They filled them up and as they took it and poured it out, the miracle happened. Water turned into wine. When you submit and surrender to the Word of God, miracles become your portion. This word submit means to yield to another. 
to the authority to surrender your control and to be obedient to authority. Submission keeps you connected with God's source of power. Power is about order. Think about power for a moment. It's delegated authority. That is not possible without submission. Think about the Tower of Babel. This is one of the great uh, mysteries of the Bible. One of the great, I mean, you could spend years studying and thinking about this. So, uh, you see, submission creates unity. It makes you as one. Uh, Submission. I have surrendered to a mission, a portion, a, a, a purpose. Submission. Think about the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, 6, the Lord said, Indeed the people are one. And they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Now think about what's being said. God said this. You may have been impressed by people and their ability or some structure. But I don't know about what God said. God said they're building something so incredible I have to go down and see it. They're building a tower and a city. A tower that's reaching. I have to go see what these people are doing. That would have never happened without submission. The Bible says they were one. Think about it. It talks about in Genesis 11, 3, Come, let us make bricks and bake them. They had asphalt for mortar. 11, 4, Come, let us build ourselves a city and tower. Have you ever been in a building project? Someone has to be in charge. All kinds of activity. There would have been those that were making the bricks. There would have been those carrying the bricks. There would have been those laying the bricks. There would have been those designing. There would have been those that are assigning of what hours to work. You're going to work the midnight shift. You're going to work this shift. You're going to work uh, this. Or you're going to work on this portion of the wall or the tower. I mean, there was so much just building this building. So much chemistry of activity and work and labor and supply and skills and there would have been foremen, there would have been supervisors, there would have been and so on, there would have been an architectural design. None of that is possible without submission. Are you submitted to your place and purpose in God? How is that possible? Never before or since has anything been built that God said, I've got to go down and see this. Unity is linked to submission. One will chase a thousand, two will chase ten thousand. That's not possible without submission. I'll mention a little bit about marriage in a few moments. That's true of a husband and wife. Have you and your wife submitted to the mission of your family? What's the mission of your family? What's the mission of the nuclear of your family? What's its purpose? What's the design? We know the Bible says be fruitful and multiply. But then what are you going to do with that which you're causing to be fruitful with? Each one in their place, their order. Each one under authority. And God said, listen to what God said, nothing can stop them. Nothing will be withheld from them. And he went down and confused the language. Listen, submission means it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about mine. 
But submission is about you, yours, and the bigger picture. Philippians 2, 2 through 4. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others above himself better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. Listen, submission is a mental approach to life. Submission has to do with how you're processing life's experiences people, relationships, how you view other people and their relationship, how you view authority, how you process someone telling you to do something. Is it offensive? <laughs> telling me what to do. Is it degrading? Do you think it's disrespectful, belittling? How do you view this world? Do you realize this is a great... But submission positions you for God's power. When I was a boy, I was taught submission. Many of you were. I was taught to obey authority. I started at home with my parents. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I was taught as a child, you didn't lip off your parents. I didn't argue with my parents. I didn't pout. I didn't get in that. I didn't sulk as a boy. If I did, there was discipline that taught me submission. At school, I respected. I was to the teacher, to the coach. Never once did my parents march down to the school. I must straighten that teacher out. Didn't give my son a B. When I got in trouble at school, the last person on planet Earth I wanted to know was my father. Our principal, Mr. Cox, he had a wooden paddle. It was about the width of this pulpit. I can still see it. It was worn for use. It had holes in it. It was filled with holes. It had a leather, like a leather tying to it. It hung on a hook in his office. Called it the Board of Education. <laughs> I remember one time, I, only one time I can remember, I, I was, you know, I can't remember what I was doing, but I ca called, and his office was right there, and he would leave the door open when this happened, and these classrooms were around in like, like a horseshoe shape, and his office was there, he would leave the door open. And he would say, son, you know what you did? Mrs. Peterson told me what you did. And, uh, I'm trying to repent. <laughs> and he said, bend over my desk. And I remember bending over his desk, and he took that thing off the wall. Boom. And I mean, all the classrooms could hear. It was a board of education. <laughs> Power throws, flows through the lines of submission. First Corinthians 11, 3. But I want you to know the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. That's a divine order that God designed. Submission is voluntary. It's a choice. No one can make you that's the revelation. 
It's a choice that positions me for power. Not even God, you have a will. Submission is not, okay, I'll do it if I have to. Submission. Is you mean I get to do this? I'm allowed to serve. Submission has with it the flavor of humility and appreciation. You mean I get to position myself in this place of ministry or responsibility? What a privilege it is. Our text, submit yourself to God. And now God is going to infuse you with power to resist the devil. It puts you in line. It puts you in order. Let me ask you, are you submitted to God? Are you in submission to God's will? God's call? His place and His purpose? Because this is where the power flows. It's an interesting scripture in the Bible. It's uh, it's astounding word. Just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. This is in the context of the revelation of submission positions you for power. This, of course, is the story of the centurion. He's a Gentile. This man is not a Jew. He finds himself in need in a cry. His servant is dying. He sends word to Jesus. Luke 7, verse 4. When they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying, The one whom he should do this was deserving. Verse 6. Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far uh, from the house, the centurion sent friends to him to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. I am not worthy that you should enter under my door. Just speak the word, and my servant be healed. That's power. That's power activated through language. Think of this. Mary and Martha. They didn't say that when Lazarus was dying. They didn't send word to Jesus and say, just speak the word and my brother will be healed. They said, Lord, come listen. This was like family. They were friends. He ate in their home a couple of times. Bible said he loved them. He wept over Lazarus. John 11, 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary said the same thing in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. My point is, there's this no-name Gentile perhaps had never met Jesus Probably no personal relationship because his friends had to tell Jesus about him. But he understood power flows through submission. Jesus, you don't have to come. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And then he gives us this incredible key in Revelation. He said, this is what I know to be true. Verse 8, I also am a man placed under authority. Having soldiers under me, I say to one, go and he goes. To another, come and he comes. To my servant, do this and he does it. I am placed under authority. I have placed myself in submission to authority. That gives me the power to speak to command. Jesus, just speak a word. 
and my son will be healed. Submission positions you for power. Are you in the place of submission? I'm in the place, he said. I have placed myself in submission. We have policemen. We have policemen in the church. They have a badge and a gun. Both of these represent authority or power. One weapon is the ability to accomplish. The badge is the right to do it. The authority. Say there's a sergeant in the police department. He has authority. He says to this one go and they go, to this one come and he comes. Maybe he has years. But for some reason, maybe there's a violation and he's fired. He no longer is under authority and he no longer has authority. When you're fired, they normally take your weapon and your badge is my understanding. And the people that listened to his words before are no longer going to listen to his words because he's been removed. He's no longer in submission. And his authority has been removed from him. This is why people who are rebellious always detonate somewhere else. Listen, you cannot demand what you forfeited. You can't demand. This policeman, he may act like a police. Sonny was telling me one time she was pulled over by this guy. Like he was a policeman. And she said, where's your bed? And he said, oh, I was at the gym. I must have left it in my gym bag. Begin to fumble around. And uh, and then when she drove, he drove away. She got his license. They couldn't find any policeman at all. He's out just pulling people over, pretending. Listen, when you're in submission, your words become powerful. You speak a language of thought. Just speak the word. You don't have to be present. I want to speak to men, to husbands, for a moment. When you are submitted to God, it's much easier for your wife to submit to you. Mm, come on. There's something in the chemistry. When people know I'm submitted to Pastor Mitchell and now Pastor Greg Mitchell, and I respect and honor them, there's something that causes them to listen to me because they know I'm in submission. Your wife won't listen to you. Pastor, she won't listen to me. I wonder if God said, well, I'm trying to show you how I feel. You won't listen to me either. I want you to see what it's like to love someone who won't listen to you, won't respect you. God says, I ask you for praise and you say you're too busy. You want your wife to praise you, but she's too busy. I can't get nothing from you. Maybe that's why you can't get nothing from her. You want to be her head, but you won't let me be your head. You want her to come to you, but you won't come to me. You want her to need you, but you act like you don't need me. I am a man under authority that qualifies me for authority. Now I can be trusted. Can God trust you? Submission is a statement. God, you can trust me. And it plugs you in to the power. 
Everywhere, you've heard me say this for you, everywhere you submit and surrender to God, you become powerful. You position yourself all the way back to Genesis 1 for blessing, fruitfulness, and dominion. I have a drill here. This is not Bobby's drill. You can tell. It looks like, looks like one of mine. Amen. It's, it's like it's never been touched by human hands. I mean, those last week were beat up, torn. As I mentioned last week, it's designed for a purpose, just like you are. What if this drill says, you know what? I don't want to submit to that extension cord. I don't, I don't, I don't like that extension cord. I don't like green. I don't want to submit to that extension cord. I want to plug in anywhere I want to plug in. I'm pulling the trigger. Nothing happens. I wonder how many of God's people are like that. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. I wonder if too many of God's people have problems with the devil when it comes to resisting his wiles, his deception, his temptation, his lies. I wonder if the real reason is you're not submitted You're not submitted. He didn't say submit yourself wherever you want to submit. He didn't say just submit yourself when you want to be submitted. He said submit yourself to God. That's a place of permanence. It's amazing to me sometimes people will submit to so many things. Submission means now my life's ordered by you. That's what